So let's go over the Gemara that we did yesterday. Uh, so we mentioned this Gemara. We are the Gemara meant the Gemara says that person could learn Torah one day a year, or one day every six months actually, and uh, took him three months to get to the base medrash and three months to get home, and they. Uh, the 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 base medrash the, uh, the 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 uh, the scholars in the in the in the study hall they called him the bar bay rav the the student who comes for one day bar bay rav lachad yoima and uh, Rabbi Yochanan was a little nervous that might cause there to be some type of a punishment to the students for sort of like making fun of him. So he said, please don't, uh, please, you know, don't think bad about the uh, students. And he gave them a whole uh, drusha of why doing what this uh, person did, the, the father of Ravidi, uh, why it was uh, the father of Rabbi Yaakov Baridi, excuse me, Ravidi, the father of Yaakov Baridi, what he did was really um, uh, uh, considered uh, special and good. And he brought a source, a pasuk, um, that um, if a person learns Torah one day a year, uh, Hashem considers it that the uh, even if he does one day a year, Hashem considers it as if he studied Torah the entire year. And then we said that the same thing applies to Peronus for punishment. And we saw that from the one day of traveling in Israel, when they came back with a, a negative report about the land of Israel, they got punished for every day, they got punished a year. And so they went for 40 days to spy out the land of Israel, and they ended up being stuck in the desert for 40 years. So we see that doing a sin one day is considered like doing the sin for an entire year. And one of the ideas behind that is that if you have, if you make a mistake, you do some type of sin, so your sin is really unintentional. But what happens if you do that sin intentionally also? If you actually sin intentionally, and then you do it by mistake. So then you can't say, oh, this was a total mistake because you do that sin intentionally as well. So if you're, you know, if you, uh, uh, you, you don't normally sin, and this was uh, something really just an, uh, an act of unintentional. So that's one thing that's, you know, something that could be wiped away. Of course, you have to do tshuva, but it's, uh, it's not considered uh, significant. It's not hard to, get a, to, to wipe it away, I should say. But once you do this sin in an intentional way, so it minimizes your excuses for the entire, all your other excuses. Because we see that you're not so sincere and serious and uh, you don't consider it so significant uh, when you do sin. So the idea is if you sin in like one day a year, do it intentionally, what happens is uh, that, that that intentional sin, it sort of gives a, uh, understanding about all of your activities the entire year, uh, and uh, therefore you're you wouldn't uh, be exempt. Now that that applies in the, the positive, where you know your whole you, you have one day that's free and you spend it on Torah. So what it shows is all the other days that you weren't able to study Torah. We're gonna we're gonna say okay, you weren't able to. You wanted to. You weren't able to. Let's say you don't spend it th that day on, on learning Torah. So then it sort of gives a, it minimizes your uh, interest and your desire for all the other days. Because we see, well, when you did have a free time, you didn't do it either. 
So it it it, it ruins your excuse for all the other days. Yes, uh, David. Yeah, it's interesting. This uh, exchange with Ravidi and Rabbi Yochanan said to him, "Do not punish the sages." Right. So it's it's interesting that what's the punishment? The punishment is from Hashem, but just him thinking about it or saying something that he was offended would cause the sages to be punished by Hashem, whether he was right or wrong. Um, the, the Hashem would take into account that he's one of the sages. And uh, what he says uh, has an effect uh, in the upper worlds and in the lower worlds. Yeah, so that's uh, that, that. That is correct. Well said. Did you see that? Uh, did you see it mentioned, uh, discussed at all? Or no, uh, no. Yeah, so that is an interesting thing that uh, uh, w- that scholars have to be extra careful. Sadiqim have to be extra careful not to think bad about someone. Because if they have any negative thoughts, it could it could destroy things. As we yeah. you know the famous story of Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Shimon by Yochai's son, where when he left the cave after studying for twelve years, and. Uh, uh, and uh, studying with his father and they ran away from the Roman government. So when he, uh, when he left the cave, anything that he looked at, he saw people uh, 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 wasting their time farming, waste, wasting their time from learning Tyra. And he looked at them bad and all of a sudden everything, you know, burned up in fire and so on. And so, <laughs> So the, uh, the the stat story gives us that idea as well that like you have to be like you have to realize um, a, a great scholar, a great sadik has to be aware that any negative, slight negative thing they could have a negative impact. Yeah. Not only a scholar, had told him. Not, yes, only a scholar, oh, not, yeah. not only a scholar, but a regular person also. There's the story of the Baal Shem Tov where these two people were arguing and one said, I'll tear you apart like a fish. And the Baal Shem Tov had his students uh, experience that in the upper worlds that he was being torn apart like a fish. And this is just a regular guy. So how much yes. more so for the sages? True, true. But your story is, a, that story that you're mentioning is a story of speech. And uh, what I was bringing out is, this, is the, about thought. Right, right. Um, so speech, everyone has to be careful from. And of course, we should be, we try to be careful about thought. But it seems that uh, a tzaddik has a much, well, we, obviously a tzaddik has much more power with his thought and uh, could, you know, could really uh, ruin things. It's very, you know, very... Very uh, um, damage. You have to be, yeah, you have to be careful. Uh, we yes, say, most definitely. Yeah. We say with, uh, that before we go to sleep at night, uh, that Hashem should, uh, that nobody should get punished on my account. But it doesn't say because of my speech. It could be my speech, my thought, anything that I would hold offense against somebody else, whether it's speech or thought. That's just a regular person, how much more so uh, a tzaddik or a sage from the Gemara. Right, right. So there are psukim in the in the Torah that talk about um, uh, if you uh, pain an orphan or a widow of a, of a, that shemaya eshmatza uh, I will surely hear their cry. That you know, if you pain them, and then uh, you know, it does you know? So there is definitely, especially depending on the the person that you're uh, hurting, there's definitely potential to cause you know that. Uh, uh, if he cries out, he could definitely cause damage to to someone pained him. So, for example, really? um, uh, I believe it's talking about an orphan over there, where uh, if you pain the orphan, that and he cries to me, I will surely hear his cry, and I will basically I will punish you. So, uh, there definitely uh, is a, is a concept of of hear Hashem hearing people's speech and hear you know people's cries and even a simple person, regular person, um, 
And uh, yeah, obviously a person should be careful with their thought as well. Uh, okay, uh, well, well said, David. Yes, Moshe. I was just going to say Rabbi Gamliel, with his uh, with some of the other Rebbeim, you know, he was very critical towards the other Rebbeim, and he ended up getting losing his job, and he was replaced by Rabbi, I think, Azaria, was it? You know, and uh, Azaria, much younger. Yeah. Yeah, and so, I mean, that was sort of like a punishment, too, for being critical. I mean, too critical towards his, uh, you know, sort of, you know, towards his colleagues and also towards some of his Tommy Deem, you know. Right. You know, right. he did get his job back, you know, you know. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I see it the same way, but uh, but here, here we're more talking about you know, causing Hashem to punish. But when his being, being so you're fired? You're saying what he did, he did wrong was because they were angry at him, caused Hashem to punish him. Yeah, okay, I don't know, maybe. Uh, um, in, in any event, a person, we should, we should, as David says, we should be careful not to have negative thoughts, anger about other people and Chas uh, V'Shalom caused someone to... Um, to be punished on our behalf. So uh, the Gemara here continues and got involved with the uh, discussion of the, our Mishnah, which was that the Mishnah had said that a cut on a child is exempt from being Eula Regal, from going to the Beis Hamikdash for the three holidays. But then the Mishnah says, but which child is exempt? Ezehu Katan, which child is this child that's exempt? And so the Mishnah says that it's talking about a child that's too young, can't even ride on his father's shoulders, according to Beis Shammai. According to Beis Hillel, a child who can't even hold, uh, can't walk up to the Beis Shammai, just holding his father's hand. Uh, so such a child is exempt from being Eula Regal. If the child is uh, mature, more mature, and can do that, can ride on his father's shoulder, or can hold his father's hand and go from Yerushalayim to Harabais, that child would be obligated in going to the Beis HaMikdosh. So the Gemara mentioned that Rav Zera had a question on this, and his question was, what are, who are we talking about that this child is going to be obligated to go to the base of Migdash? What about the child's uh, need to nurse and the child is, uh, uh, you know, he's, he needs his mother and his mother is not obligated to go to the base of Migdash. So this person is traveling from away from Yushalayim. And will someone come to pick me up and take me down there? Uh, four, 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 yeah? Yes, ma'am. We'll come. We will so the uh the the, the, the Gemara had asked this the question of Rabzera Rabzera had asked, he said that uh, who brought him until here? How did he get to Yushalayim? So meaning that you know there needs to be uh some type of a uh uh, 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 maturity in this child if he doesn't need his mother, and if he doesn't need his mother uh, to you know to be with him, then seemingly he's he's of age to be uh, to go on his father's shoulders, or even to hold his father's hand. It would seem like uh, it would seem like he must be uh, you know why are we giving him this calculation? In other words, the the, the measurement of how we're saying he's obligated to go to the base on Mikdash is based on if he can hold his father's hand and uh, go from the Yushalayim to the mountain or to the courtyard of the temple. How did he get to Yushalayim in the first place? It would seem that he's obviously of age, if he could get to Yushalayim in the first place without his mother. So the Gemara's answer was... Oh, what are you saying? The Gemara's answer is that 
um, that really his mother also goes along. That's what the Gemara's answer is. That the mother is also obligated in simcha, in rejoicing. How do we know it's not talking about a child who the family lives in Yerushalayim? He just can't make it to the Temple Mount. So the, the law is talking about all of the Jewish people. It's a law to everyone. So if we're giving this measurement, it, it, it would seem surprising that you're going to obligate anyone to, uh, to bring their child from far away, even though you know, the, 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 there is no way that the child is, would be able to, uh, to handle it without the mother. So it would seem that, uh, again, if we were just talking about people who, uh, you know, who lived, but I don't know if Yushalayim was a place where, did they, did they live in Yushalayim? Were there, was Yushalayim, it says, Yushalayim wasn't divided among the tribes. I wonder how that worked. Um, I'm not really sure how, there is a statement in the Gemara that says Yushalayim le'neschal kalashvatim, that Yushalayim wasn't divided uh, among the tribes. So I don't know if people really lived uh, in Yushalayim. They, they did, I don't know. To, to see how that, how that fits with that Gemara. But, um, uh, but e even if they did, the point is that the Mishnah's law is applicable to all, you know, to, it's applicable to the entire Jewish people. So, how would they be uh, obligating this child to go from, you know, as long as he's able to walk, that's his chinuch. His chinuch is, is that he's of age of chinuch. Because he can go from Islam to Harabais. That, that, that measurement should have nothing to do with deciding if this child is, is of age. Because the, it, it's not applicable to, the, to a child if he can do that. It's applicable if maybe he could go from his house from far away to Yerushalayim. Fine, that I would understand. Then he was of age. You're of age. To, to, but if, if you're, if it's giving this measurement, it just seems that he must be much older already. And he obviously doesn't need his mother. So the Gemara's answer is that no, his mother is going along with him because she's also obligated in Simcha. And being that she's also obligated in rejoicing in rejoicing with her husband, so she's going to go along. And therefore, she's, uh, we, she's nursing him along the way. And just when he gets to Yushalayim, then the father has to be able to take him to, and he has to be able to either go on the father's shoulders or to be able to uh, walk with the father uh, up from Yerushalayim to the uh, Temple Mount. Okay. So what the Gemara's questions seem to have been that it, it, the, the, the measurement doesn't fit with the situation. In other words, if the child is weaned already, so then he should, there's no question that he should be able to to, to walk from Yushalayim to, he's already weaned. And if he's not weaned yet, which it sounds like, how did he get there? So the Gemara's answer is that, no, the mother's going along. Now, the Gemara then asks a question from uh, Anbei Shammai's view. And the question was asked by Rebbe in, the, uh, in place of the uh, behalf of uh, Beis Hillel. And Basically, it's from the story of Chana bringing Shmuel to the Mishkan. And uh, Shmuel uh, was, at that stage, at some point during that stage, he was capable of going on his father's shoulders. Why? Because a child, according to the Torah, according to the Gemara, child doesn't get weaned until 24 months. That's the normal uh, you know, age of a child being weaned. And a being that a child could go on his father's shoulders, maybe from nine months, uh, a year, year old. So it would seem 
that even before Shmuel Hanavi was weaned, he should have been able to ride on his father's shoulders. And what does Chana say? No, I'm not bringing him to the Beis Hamikdash until I'm not bringing him to the Mishkan until he's weaned. You got to wait till he's weaned. What do you mean? Beis Shammai says you got to bring him from the age he could ride on his father's shoulders. And riding on the father's shoulders should be much earlier than the age of being weaned. So that's the Gemara's question on Beis Shammai. It's not the Gemara's question, Rebbe's question on Beis Shammai. And, um, uh, the, and, and who answers Rebbe? His father. Shem ben Gamliel, his father says that according to you, Chana herself. Chana herself. Like, what about her? Wasn't she obligated in, in rejoicing? She should have gone herself. What, what, got, what made her exempt from going to the, in other words, you're asking about her child. How did she, how, how would she, Trans, according to Beis Shammai, how did she, how did she transgress this law of chinuch, educating the child? And uh, the the question the, the Gemara says, what about herself? How did she transgress the law herself? And the answer is, Chana Mifankusa Yaser Sochazia Be'be Shmuel. She was uh, she saw uh, in Shmuel some type of a, a weakness or. The delicateness, and um, she was nervous about him for the uh, uh, the, the weakness of, of traveling. And uh, because of that, it was like a matter of health that he couldn't, uh, he couldn't travel. So uh, be, being that that's the case, so she also would have been exempt from going. And she said that she's not going with uh, she's not bringing him because he's weak. He seems to be weak. So what comes out from this uh, Gemara is that Beis Shammai's view that based on being able to ride on a father's shoulders, being able to ride on one's father's shoulders, that could be the measurement when a child is obligated to be brought to Yerushalayim for the three holidays. I, Shmuel, didn't... Uh, wasn't brought to Yerushalayim when he was a child, even though he could have rode on his father's shoulders. Why wasn't he brought? And the same thing is, how did Chana, what about Chana? She was supposed to be do the mitzvah of Simcha with her husband. Why didn't she go to the Beis HaMikdash? And the answer is that that case is an exception. What's the exception? The exception is that, the exception is that uh, Shmuel was sick, was weak. He wasn't uh, up to it. He wasn't able to go. And because of that, it would be an exemption for Hannah as well from going to Beyoyla Regal. But really, Beishamai, uh holds that the age is going on one's father's shoulders. Now, the Gemara doesn't ask this question on Beis Hillel. Because Beis Hillel says that as long as you could hold your father's hand and go up from Yushalayim to the Temple Mount, or the, to the courtyard, that would be, uh, you would be obligated in education. Because that, you could say, is, an, is a later stage, like around the stage of weaning. Some kids don't walk until that stage and so on. So you could say, you know, they walk that distance and uphill. So you could say that Beis Hillel is not a contradiction from the story. But Beis Shammai seems to be proven wrong from the story of Shmuel. The Gemara says, no, it's not a, it's not a, a disproof because Shmuel was sick. It's an exception. There was an exception to the rule there. Shmuel was sick. So now comes the next Gemara. This is a very interesting Gemara because it touches upon some very basic ideas of the obligation of Chinuch. We'll soon see why why I say that. We're on page six A.
And we are at the words boy, Rebbe Shimon. It's about maybe 12 lines from the top. Let's see, 5, 10, maybe 15, 14 lines from the top of the page. 6a. Boy, Rebbe Shimon, Rebbe Shimon asked a question. Koton Chiger, a child that is lame. A child that's lame, according to Beishamai, and someone who's blind, according to both of them, Mahu, what is the din? What is the law about Chinuf? Now, for some reason, the Gemara seems to be thinking that even though this child, if he would be an adult at this age, what would the law be if someone's blind? Are they obligated in going to the base on Migdash? Anyone remember our Mishnah? Page 2a? Not even one eye. So not even one eye is an argument, it seems. Possibly an argument. We know one opinion that says that Summa Ba'achas is putter. So one opinion holds that even one eye, you're right, is exempt. But uh, it's possible that someone, that others argue on that. But what about two eyes? If someone's blind with both eyes, are they obligated? So our Mishnah said, Chutz, excluding, Summa, Summa. So mention the Summa, the blind person, in the Mishnah on page 2a, the first Mishnah when we started the tractate. So we mentioned the blind person is exempt. What about a Chiger? Is a chiger exempt? Chiger is someone who's lame. Are they exempt from going to the base Amigdash three times a year? So also, our Mishnah, ha-chiger, the chiger was excluded from being obligated in re'iyah and going to the base Amigdash. So we have two exemptions, a chiger and a suma. What does the Gemara ask over here? It says that according to Beishamai, what about a child who's a chiger, who's lame? What would the din be? Is he obligated in going to the base of English? You have to bring him. You have to bring him to the base of English. Bring him on your on his father's shoulders and carry him. Would he be obligated in Chinuch to go to the base of English? Now he's lame. If he was an adult, he'd for sure be exempt. But he's a child. Maybe he's obligated. Really? A child more obligated than a, an adult? Is that is that logical? And then the same thing is blind. Blind is going to be exempt if he's an adult. But if it's a child, the Gemara says, maybe he should be obligated. Really? A child should be more obligated than an adult? I thought it's education. I thought is, he he always, is he always going to be lame? So that's, a, that's, a, that's the Gemara's question here. The Gemara asked that. Good, good point, Isaac. The Gemara now will, will, will mention that. That's one, that's one point. Now, before we go to that point, and that's a very good point that you make, um, the uh, the question is, why is the Gemara only asking this question on Beis Shammai and not on Beis Hillel? So the, the, the question on Beis Shammai is based on the fact that Beis Shammai says that what is the exemption of a child? When is a child exempt? What is Beis Shammai's thing? He's exempt if he can't sit on his father's shoulder. And sit on his father's shoulders, he's obligated. What does Beis Hillel say? What is, when is the exemption of a child? Child is exempt from chinuch, education, of this mitzvah, going to the base of English three times a year. When is he exempt? According to Beis Hillel, he's exempt if he can't hold his father's hand and walk. So what would a chiger be if he's a child? A child that's a chiger, that's lame. Would he be obligated according to Beis Hillel? Do we know? The Gemara only asks according to Beis Shammai. What would the law be according to Beis Hillel? Beis Hillel says you have to be able to walk uh, with you holding your father's hand to the base of Megiddo. So what would the din be? What would the law be if a child is lame? Would he be obligated? Oh, he can't walk. He can't walk. Mother. He can't walk, so he holds his father's hand. His father will be pulling him, <laughs> dragging him. That won't be walking. He has to be able to walk with his father, holding his father's hand, but he's got to walk. So if he can't walk, if he's lame... He's for sure exempt. So a child that's lame is for sure exempt according to Beis Hillel. But according to Beis Shammai, 
maybe he'd be obligated. Why would he be obligated? Well, Beishamai says the main thing is you got to sit on your father's shoulders. Can a lame person sit on his father's shoulders? Sure. Lame person, a lame child can sit on his father's shoulders, have balance, hold on. He won't, won't uh, fall off or squirmies himself off. So he'll be able to hold himself on his father's shoulders. He's lame, but he can sit on his father's shoulders. So the Gemara asks, maybe he should be obligated in going to the base of English. Okay, so we have a question here. And as I said, it seems surprising. But Isaac says, well, let's see, maybe when he's an adult, he is going to be, he's going to be healed. So the Gemara says, hey, dummy, what is the case that we're talking about? How are we talking? Elema, if you want to say, the Chiger, a lame person, who is not going to be healed, and um, uh, and a blind person who is not going to be uh, given his eyesight back. So if we're talking about such a person, in other words, there's no, uh, this is not a temporary sickness. This is a permanent sickness. If we're talking about a permanent sickness, so hash the godo potter cotton me boy. If an adult would be exempt, would a child not be a you. question? Would there be any question about a child? If he was an adult, he'd be exempt. So a child for sure should, should be exempt. So like Tricha, it's not necessary to ask such a question, only it must be so, talking about a child that is a chiger, that is lame, that could heal himself. And we're talking about a blind person that will be healed. That is, the, 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 you know, there might be surgery later on. In the meantime, he's blind. But he is going to be, he could be healed. And so, therefore, the Gemara has a question. My, what is the law? What is the law about such a person? Would he be obligated in being educated? Rebbe, I'd say, yes. I'd argue even yes, because even though he himself is lame and will never have to go up himself, eventually he's going to marry and have children. So he has to know the halacha for them. So if you're talking about chinuch, then the obligation of chinuch should be for him to be able to pass it down, even if he himself will never be able to walk. So that's an interesting, uh, you know, perspective, thinking very long term, uh, which is an uh, interesting, interesting thought. So you want to say that he'd be obligated because his obligation to his child. I uh, guess, yeah. Deserves some thought. That uh, definitely deserves some thought. The, um, I mean, it's uh, a double shame, you know, that doesn't exist yet, but. Yeah, but still. If there's a chiyav on learning, the question is, when does that learning period end, if at all? Mm -hmm. Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll have to put that on the side and think about it and continue, uh, uh, bring, bring it up after. Let's see what the Gemara answers. So the Gemara answers that Amr Abaye, Abaye says, Kol hecha the godo, any time that an adult would be mechaev midaraiso, where he would be obligated under, uh, according to the, uh, on the biblical level, he would be obligated to do a mitzvah. A child also, we would educate him rabbinically. Wherever an adult would be exempt on a biblical level, so Midrabonon, Kotonami Potter, rabbinically, he would also be exempt as well. So even though the child is going to is going to uh, reach a stage where he will be obligated later, but the fact is we cannot obligate him now because if he would be an adult, he would also be exempt. So what does this really, what does this really mean? So there, there's there's two ways of understanding chinuch, education. One way is 
that this child is exempt. Why is he exempt? He's not old enough. If we put age on the side and say, well, not old enough, okay, but we need to educate him. So this is the age of education. So he's not old enough to do the mitzvah on a biblical level. But because we need to educate him, get him ready, so let's put age on the side and say, now he is obligated because, because, he's, uh, because he needs this education. So we're going to obligate him like any adult and say, you being that your only issue, your issue is underage, and you, you know the, we, we have a mitzvah, chinuch, which basically means that we will uh, uh, have you fulfill these mitzvahs at your age, being that we want you to fulfill these mitzvahs at your age, at a younger age, so we're going to say, you're obligated. Or is education all about the fact that, it's not that we're obligating you to do the mitzvahs. The same mitzvah that the adult has, we're saying you have to do it. We're, we're educating you to do what you're going to need to do when you're an adult. Are we educating you now to be ready for what you're going to need to do as an adult? You should know the laws. You should, you should, be, you should be familiar with what, 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 what you're going to need to know when you get older. So that would be a difference in the case, let's say, of someone who's blind, but he's going to get healed. This child, he's blind now, but he's going to go through some surgery and he's going to get healed. At this stage, would the father be obligated in giving him education? Well, it really depends. If it's all about educating him to plan for, the, for, for his adult adulthood, so he needs it. He's going to be soon obligated in mitzvahs. He's soon going to be obligated in mitzvahs. So we need to prepare him properly, give him this training, train him, train him for the mitzvahs. You're going to tell me he's blind? Okay, but he's soon going to need to know. So we got to train him, even though he's blind, but he's, he's going to need to know he's going to be, he's going to be healed soon and he is going to be obligated. So we got to get him, got to train him. So train him now. He's, 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 he's of the age of training, according to the, Halachic rulings of what age you got to start training. He's of age to train. Train him now. He's blind. If he's an adult, if he was blind, you'd be exempt. Okay. But you still got to train him for his adult. For, because when he's an adult, he is going to be obligated. So you got to train him properly. But what happens if you think of chinuch education a little differently? If education is not training him because he might be, he's going to be obligated later and you need to train him now for later, it's that we put on him the obligation of what adults are obligated. That's what we're giving him. Any obligation that an adult would be obligated, we're saying you have to do it. So that, that, would, that would mean that, well, he's blind. He's a child and he's underage, but we're giving him the obligations of the adult. But the obligations of the adult doesn't apply to someone who's blind. So he has another exemption called being blind. He's, it's temporary blindness, but temporary blind is blind, for, at least temporarily, he's exempt. And at this stage, he's actually going to be exempt. So it, there's really two ways of understanding chinuch. And the way the Gemara seems to conclude is that chinuch is only If he would be obligated as an adult, it sounds like from this Gemara that chinuch is that the obligation of an adult is placed on. And if he's blind, he's going to be exempt. It sounds like that the teaching, the fundamental rule of education is that the laws of an adult are placed on him. And I'll give you an example where this seems to play itself out. There is a law regarding shaking the lul of an esrim that it needs to be your own. You have to own it. So whenever someone comes to you 
and says, did you shake lulav and esrog yet today? Okay, here, here, take, you can shake. You make a bracha and shake it, right? When a Lubavitcher boy comes and offers you to shake the lulav and esrog. So what does he tell you on the first day of Sukkot? He says it's a gift on the condition that you return it. It's a matana manas lahachzir. Why do we say it's a gift? Because it has to be owned by you. Now, if the boy is just lending it to you, it's not good enough. You're not fulfilling the mitzvah. So he says, you know what? I'm giving it to you as a gift on the condition you give it back, right? What happens if it's a child? A child under bar mitzvah. A child under bar mitzvah, he can receive a gift, but he can't give a gift back. So you're going to have a big problem. If you give your lulav and esru to a child, and he takes it, he is incapable of giving it back to you according to halacha. Halacha, a child can't really give a gift because he doesn't have das, he doesn't have enough knowledge of responsibility mm -hmm. to be able to give a gift. So what happens is, what do you do for a child that you want him to, you want to educate him in rule of an esrit? Mm -hmm. When all the parents know about this, you have to spend money and buy him his own lulav and esri. So if you have an older child who's bar mitzvah already, him you don't have to buy a lulav and esri because he can use yours. You could give it to him as a gift and he gives it back to you. But a child under bar mitzvah who can't give something back to you, you actually have to buy him a lulav and esri of his own. Now, Why do you have to buy him his own? Because he has to own it and you're going to need to use it afterwards. And if he gives it, he can't give it back to you. And so it becomes a problem of owning it and you owning it afterwards. It basically ends up being a problem. And therefore you, uh, you have to buy him his own so he can own it and it's his and he's fulfilling the mitzvah properly. The question is, there is an opinion in Shulchan Aruch that says that you don't have to buy him his own. You can lend him yours without giving it to him. And you fulfill the mitzvah of chinuch. Another opinion says, no, <laughs> you can lend it to him, but you're not, you're not fulfilling the mitzvah of chinuch. You're not educating him because it's not his. But there is an opinion that says you are fulfilling the mitzvah of chinuch. You educated him. Why? Because is this a real lulav? Is this a real esrog? It's real. It's a, it's a real lulav. It's a real esrog. The fact is that the lulav and esrog is missing, in, in a certain sense, the, the ownership aspect. But if the mitzvah of chinuch is education, and this is educating him with a real lulav and esrog, it's all about education. And education you fulfilled because you're preparing him for when he gets older to know how to take the lulav and esrog. So you've done the mitzvah properly. It's a real lulav, it's a real esrog. You've given him, the, you've given him this mitzvah to fulfill. It's not his, but it doesn't have to be his because it's all about education. However, if you're going to say that the mitzvah of the adult is now falls on the child and the child has to do the mitzvah that the adult would be obligated in, then you'd say, well, it has to be his as well because the obligation of the adult is now, is now on the child. So there's two ways of learning the obligation of chinuch. And our Gemara seems to be implying that the mitzvah of chinuch is not just education, but you would have to buy your child his own lulav and esrig because it has to be his, because the mitzvah of chinuch, your machanachim, the way a, uh, a, 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 a the way an adult, the adult is obligated, the child is obligated. That we put the obligation of the adult on the child, and therefore the the child would be obligated in the same mitzvah that the adult is obligated in with all the criteria and details of it. Yes, uh, David. What about holding on to the Lula of Anesra while the child is taking it from you? 
so it doesn't leave your hands. I believe it says in the Shulchan Aruch that it doesn't work. You know, uh, it, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, uh, it sounds like educational, you know, like you're, you know, you're, you know, you're helping him, but it's, uh, it, you know, if you want him to fulfill his mitzvah of, uh, of, uh, uh, of owning it and you, uh, you know, either he owns it or you own it. How, like, who's owning it? How are you getting it back? It, 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 it definitely is not a, a simple, uh, uh, it's not, it, it's not a simple thing to say it's kosher. If you want to tell me someone, there's an opinion that says it's okay, maybe, but it's not the common uh, thing. I know all, uh, what I, what I can tell you is the Gemara says, definitely don't give it to the child. And Shulchan Aruch, don't give it to the child because then you're going to be stuck afterwards that you don't own it. Now, this one, some commentary say such a thing, maybe, uh, you know, I don't know. It's definitely not the, uh, especially not in today's day and age when you can buy a little Vanessary very cheap and, you know, you buy you buy your child a little Vanessary. But uh, it, maybe there is such a view. I don't know. Is that what you've heard from Rabbanim? Did you ever hear Rabbanim say that, that you can do that? No, I've, I've just seen it. Uh -huh. I haven't heard yeah, there's a lot of ignorant uh, things going on with with when it comes to Lula and Esrig. Like uh, people don't realize the importance of saying that it's a matanah menas lahach that yeah, you know, you have to own it. They just, you know, they just uh, hand it to them, but um, uh, and then they hand it, they give it to their kids. You know, a lot of people aren't familiar with the uh, with the rules. Okay, uh, I think someone else wanted to say something. I don't know who it was. Anyone? Okay, let's go further then. <laughs> There's a lot of background noise, Rabbi. Yeah, let me mute. Let me mute. Okay. Okay. Beishama uh, Yoimer, Beishama says, Hariya Shtei Kesem. Shammai says that Re'iya, the uh, carbon, the sacrifice of the Oilas um, Re'iya, the, the, the burnt offering, has to at least be two uh, coins, two uh, kesef, two silver uh, coins of uh, called ma'is. Um, now, uh, the Shammai Chagiga didn't have to be worth that much, and even one was enough. And Basilo said, uh, is the opposite. Tanu Rabbanan, the rabbis learned. In a b'risa. Beishama Yomer Beishamai says, Hariya shtei kesef, v'achigigamal kesef. The burnt offering has to be uh, worth two uh, silver maz, and the chagiga is one silver maz. The, again, the chagiga is a Carbon shlamim, a peace offering. So you have the burnt offering and the peace offering. Burnt one, according to Beishamai, is worth more. Two silver kesef, silver muz. And uh, the chagiga, the uh, peace offering, was one silver muz. Shari'iya oila kula legavayr. Why? Because the carbon re'iya is a sacrifice that's a burnt offering. And it goes entirely to Hashem. But that's not so by the Chagiga. The Chagiga is only as a peace offering. And the owner eats some of it. Um, the Kayanim eats some of it. And therefore, it would make sense to give more to the Karban Ayla, which is all for Hashem, that it should be worth more, it should be valued more. The oid, and another reason, additionally, Matsina we found Batseres regarding the Karbonis on Shavuos. Atzeres is another word for Shavuos, and the Gemara uses the term Atzeres uh, based on the Pasuk. The Pasuk says Atzeres Tiyalachem. So the Gemara says that 
we find by Atzeres, by Shavuos, Shariba behen akosov bi'oilois, yoiser mi b'shlamim, that there are, we find by Atzeres, by Shavuos, that uh, there's more um, oilois, there's more burnt offerings than the uh, peace offerings. Rashi brings over here that we find by Shavuos and uh, in the parsha of Shorai Kesev, which is uh, one of the portions that's read on the holidays. So uh, it says over there, you should bring with the bread, the, there were two breads that were brought on Shavuos, should bring uh, with the bread or for the bread, Shivas Kavasim Tamimim, seven sheep, Upar Ben Bakar and one, Ax, Echod, Parvam Vakar, Echod one, the Elam Shnaim, two rams, you Oila Lashem, those are going to be Oilas, burnt offerings. And it says about a Shlamim, it says two Kvasim Neshana for the Shlamim, that there are two sheep for the carbon Shlamim. So we have much more Oilas than Shlamim. And because of that, that uh, Shavuos, we find that you have. Uh, much more uh, burnt offerings than uh, than uh, peace offerings. It would make sense that uh, we should give more importance to the uh, to the burnt offering than the peace offering, and therefore we would uh, instead we would instead use uh, give more, make it make the oil more expensive. Yes, uh, David. But we see the exact opposite regarding Sukkot, because the first days are the are representing the non the, the nations of the world, and there's a lot more. And when it gets down to the end, which is um, uh, Shemini Atzeres, then uh, all the all the offerings representing the nations of the world are done. And only the uh, less in quantity offerings of the Jewish people are done for Atzeres. So it's not necessarily that the quantity represents the importance or the quality. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah, but what's the uh, calculation of of uh, burnt offering versus peace offering? Oh, that I was just looking at the number of offerings. The offerings are much more in the first seven days. And in the first day, it's the most. And then by the time it gets less and less, and then by the time you get to the last day, all the offerings representing the, the uh, nations of the world are, are done. And only yeah. the small quantity, which is representing the Jewish people for Atzeres, the Shemini Atzeres, in, qual in quantity is the smallest. But that's the most important. Uh-huh. So you're saying that maybe the fact that something's smaller number means that it's more valuable. Well, not necessarily, but not, the fact that it's smaller is not necessarily that it's less valuable. Right. Okay. But the thing is that it's a little hard to compare it to, to that because there we're, we're looking at each nation as one and we're counting all together 70 and we're slowly minimizing them to show that they're coming to an end. And the one Jewish nation is, is stays. So we're not like minimizing, we're not saying that a lower number is just as significant to a higher number, but we're just, we're just minimizing all the seven. We didn't lower, you know, we didn't say any one is, the, in other words, we were just, just, you know, there are 70 nations and there is the one Jewish people and this symbolizes the Jews and that symbolizes the Goyim and there you come to an end and we don't. And so it ends up being that, uh, uh, that we stay. I don't think you can you can prove anything from there that one is uh, that having a smaller number of sacrifices is uh, uh, is uh, just as good as having a large number of sac. You know what I mean? Like it it, it means that it, it's like in, you you can't uh, measure anything by number of sacrifices. There we were we were we were giving everyone an equal number, and then we said that the goya ended. We didn't go up or down certain sense you know what i mean each nation is is their that number they they stayed their same number you know the jews didn't go from 70 to one the jews stayed at one all along 
You know what I mean? We were giving each nation uh, their own sacrifice. So you can't say that the, you know, a larger number or smaller number, one's better, one's worse. Every nation was was equal. We just, all we did was, we just said that they're going to come to an end. So I don't know if you can compare the two. It sounds like an interesting uh, uh, thought, but uh, yeah, I don't know if it's uh, such a hard, you know, I don't know if it's a, it's a question. So the Gemara uh, says that Beis Hillel has their claim. And what is Beis Hillel's claim? Beis Hillel oimrim ha-re'iya ma kesef, v'chagiga shte kesef. The, the re'iya, the carbon oil, it has to be worth at least one silver ma. And the chagiga, exactly the opposite of Beis Shaman, chagiga has to be worth two. So they want to say that the chagiga should be worth more. And what's their source? Shechagiga yeshno lefnei adibor. There was even a carbon chagiga uh, before Hashem gave the Torah, before the dibor, which means the before Hashem is uh, um, uh, speaking to us at Har Sinai, Mount Sinai, with the giving of the Torah. So they, there was even a chagiga there, and so chagiga has a special something special about it. Vaid matzino benasiim. We also find by the uh, by the offerings of the Nesim of the leaders of the tribes, Shariba Behen Akosum, that in those by the tribes, we find that the uh the, the Torah is that the um when they brought their offerings, there was more shlamim, there was more peace offerings than the um than the uh than the uh, burnt offerings. And, um, you know, if you look through the numbers, it says over there, I don't know if you remember, but it's in, in the laning, when we uh, lane about all the prophets, all the... Uh, not prophets, the, um, the the leaders, the Nesim, the leaders of the tribes, that it's like the same paragraph repeats itself 12 times. So at the end of that paragraph is, in for, the, for the sacrifice of the peace offering, you gave two bakar, cattle, elim uh, chamisha, five rams, atudim chamisha, Kvasim bene shana chamisha, five of these, five of that, five of the other, uh, 15 altogether, plus the two uh, uh, elam shana, two rams, and the two uh, uh, bakar. No, I'm sorry, not two rams, five rams. Elam, atudim, and kvasim, five. So 15 plus the two bakar, the two cattle, came to 17 sacrifices of, of peace offerings. And that was the sacrifice. They all brought that same sacrifice. How many oilis? So, uh, um, I'm trying to remember the verse. Uh, uh, I have to look it up. But anyway, it was much less uh, uh, carbon. Uh, Rashi brings the the entire number. Oh, I guess you could figure it out from that. He says there were 36 oilers, so it means there were three. Um, there were three, uh, um, there were three, uh, three sacrifices. So three out of 17. So you see there was a lot more uh, carbon shlumims than oilers. So that's the, um, that's the, uh, reason of base Hillel that you should spend more on the Chagiga than on the Re'iyah. So here you have an argument between Beshamay base Hillel, which one should be more expensive, which one should be less expensive, and to be continued, Mit Hashem tomorrow. Zayin Gesund. Have a wonderful day, everyone. I guess I put you all to sleep. Uh, bye bye. Thank you, Rabbi. I'm still here. <laughs> right. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you, Rabbi. Good afternoon. Okay.